Okay. Uh, let me kind of bring you up to speed here. A couple weeks back, myself and some of the other pastors at Hope Chapel, we were sitting in a meeting, and we were discussing all of the things that are happening right now, you know, things like reopening plans and mandates by the county. We're, I mean, we're really, we're several churches in two different states and three different counties, so there's a lot of logistics that go into this and stuff, and so we were talking about all this. Uh, and so as we were talking, there were two words that kept popping up more than anything else in our meeting. It was, what if? We kept saying these words, what if? Like, what if a county puts new mandates in place? What if we aren't able to open the kids' ministry as soon as we like? What if we're second wave of the pandemic? What if, what if, what if, what if? We kept asking what if. And so jokingly, I said, you know what? That kind of sounds like the name of our next sermon series, what if? Well, we have to be careful what I ask for because that's the sermon series that we're going to be doing, this idea of what if. And so listen to me, basically at its core, the question of what if is it's really nothing more than a question of possibility. It's a question of potential. It's a question of outcome. Uh, and, and maybe you never thought about this, but we face many what-if moments each and every day, whether we realize it or not. All right, so real quick, let me ask this, just for instance. How many of you, when you wake up in the morning, when the alarm goes off, you hit the snooze bar? Come on, snooze button hitters? Okay, about half of you. Okay, so I like to hit the snooze button as well. Do you know that that is a what-if moment? Because it's in that moment where you're thinking to yourself, okay, what if I hit the snooze button one more time? Uh, I can just shower tomorrow. You know, I don't need to eat breakfast, you know, right? Or what if I get up, get up immediately when the alarm goes off? Well, then I can eat breakfast today. I'll have time. Or I'll get to work on time today. All these are, That is a what if moment. How about this one? Here's another easy one. How many of you are guilty of driving around with your fuel light on in your car, low gas? Come on. All right? I, I'm always enamored by this question, right? So I'm, I'd rather keep it more full than empty. Uh, but some people in my family are the other way around. And so uh, the fuel light at times is on. And so the what if moment is like, what if I just drive past that gas station? Or what if I, um, you know, go another 50 miles with this fuel light on? <laughs> or the real question should be, what if I get stranded? Who's going to come rescue me, right? So this idea of what if, it happens to us all of the time. And so at the end of the day, the what if is nothing more than a crossroads we come to. Listen to me. It's that when we have to ask ourselves what currently is, to look beyond what currently is, to see what the possible outcome could be. That's what a question of what if is. I remember a what if question that I faced 25 years ago now. Some of you might know this about me. I came from a background in law enforcement, and I felt the Lord calling me into full-time ministry. And I had a lot of what-if questions. What if I'm not hearing God correctly? What if I don't like doing ministry? Right? What if that's the case? I loved law enforcement at the time. And so uh, what if I don't like, what if I can't support a family someday on a pastor's salary? What if, what if, what if, what if? All right? And so really what the, the crossroads for me was that either I could choose to play it safe and do what I'd always done, or I could choose to step out in faith and trust God fully for the outcome. Well, here I am, 20 years later, I've trusted God for the outcome, and I went into full-time ministry. And so I, knowing that, I believe that even Hope Chapel Lee Summit, we are at a what-if moment. We are at a crossroads. I mean, just in the last six months of this church alone, you guys have a new pastor, you have a new name, right? You've had many of our core families have had just tragedy after tragedy. And, and so there's so many things that have been happening. And because of that, I think that we're facing this what if moment where do we play it safe and do what's easiest? Or do we step out in faith and trust God fully for the outcome of what he can do in this place? And so over the next couple of weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the core values that God has given Hope Chapel and I believe it's going to help us build a framework. It's going to be kind of like a groundwork. There's that old saying, like, Rome wasn't built in a day, you know? And so it's going to take time, and we've got to build a good framework, a healthy one, for us to see what God can realize here. Uh, and so the first value that we're going to talk about today is of one called freedom. Everyone say freedom. freedom. Okay, through your masks, like Braveheart, Mel Gibson freedom. Come on. Freedom. Freedom. It's a big deal to us as Christians. We're going to look at one single verse today. It's found in Galatians 5.1. And the neat thing is there's three things in this one verse that tell us about freedom. And so I love this particular verse. Let me read Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Let's pray. Lord, I love you so much. And Lord, I just pray as we talk about freedom that we would understand freedom not in the context of us in America, but in the context of biblically what freedom really is to us as believers. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts, and allow the Holy Spirit to move within us. Lord, we ask this in your name. Everyone said... Amen. So real quick, show of hands, how many of you love freedom? You're fans of freedom, okay? Those of you not raising your hand, you're actually telling me how much you love freedom right now. 
because you chose not to raise your hand, all right? So either way, I got you, okay? We love freedom. It's baked into our very DNA, right? Here in America, like last weekend, we just celebrated what holiday? Fourth of July, our independence, right? Freedom from tyrannical rule, right? Freedom from from taxation without representation, freedom of religion, all these sort of things we celebrate. So even in America, freedom is a really big deal. But here's the thing. As much as I hate to admit it, I think that the freedom that we chase after in our nation is a little bit of an illusion at times. It's a little bit of a fantasy. Uh, Let me illustrate this. A couple weeks back, I was talking with my daughter. She just turned 15, and uh, we're talking about her getting her driver's permit. Now, I don't remember if my parents were freaking out at the notion of me driving a 4,000-pound missile down public streets. But I am freaking out at the notion of her driving a 4,000-pound missile down public streets. And so, so as, as I was talking to her about it, I was thinking back to when I was that age and how excited I was to get my driver's license. Do you guys remember how excited you were to get your driver's license? Right? Why were we so excited? That little piece of plastic represents one thing. What is it? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom from having our parents drive us everywhere. Freedom from having to bum rides off of everybody. Freedom from to come and go whenever you wanted it, which is freedom to us. But here was the thing. When I got my license, I realized, and maybe this was a different experience for you, but I realized if I actually wanted to drive, I needed a car. And if I needed a car, guess what else I needed? Money, right? And so if I needed money, what did I need? A job. And so if I got a job, all of a sudden what happened was is now I've got less free time I can't see my friends as often. I've got responsibilities. And on top of that, I had to pay for things like insurance and gas and maintenance and all those sort of things too. And so basically what we thought was going to be a tons of freedom actually began the road down tons of responsibility that after a while kind of feels like bondage in some ways, right? And it's kind of funny too. This is a true story. By the time I finally had enough money saved up for a little beater of a car, I bought a little Ford Fiesta. That was my first car, 1979 Ford Fiesta. That you could pick it up and lift it. Okay, it was so small. Uh, and so, literally, the first day I had it, I drove it to high school. It died in the intersection in front of my high school, like this big, massive high school I went to. I almost got out of it and just disowned it. Like, that's not my car. I don't know whose that is. <laughs> it was so embarrassing, but then I had to fix that as well. And so anyway, our idea of freedom sometimes is kind of an illusion because think about this. When we're kids, we cannot wait to be adults because when we're adults, we'll have so much freedom. But when we're adults, now how, much, how many times do we find ourselves longing to be kids again? Like when we didn't have debt, we didn't have responsibilities, we could use the bathroom in peace. I mean, all these sort of things. That we still, so we're chasing this illusion a little bit. And so knowing that, if you've ever read this book of Galatians, six short chapters, you know that Paul is writing about the same topic. He loves freedom. He's all about freedom. Of course, the only difference is he's not talking about this, this fantasy freedom that we tend to chase in the world, but instead he's talking about this spiritual kind of freedom that only comes from the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I call it gospel freedom. It's not worldly freedom, it's not fantasy freedom, it's it's gospel freedom. And interestingly, gospel freedom is the only freedom that has the power to set us free. To set us free from our past, from our mistakes, from our fears, from our worry, from anxiety, from addictions, from trauma, from sickness, from tragedy. Gospel freedom is the only one that has the power to truly set us free from those things. In fact, the more that we look for that kind of freedom in the world around us, do you guys know this? Often the more kind of bondage we find, right? Because if we, if we don't turn to Jesus for our freedom, what do we do? We turn to substance abuse, or we turn to bad relationships, or we turn to medication, all these sort of things to try to process and cope with all these things, when in fact we can find that freedom in Jesus. And so some of you might recall here uh, that the whole reason Paul wrote this book is because there were some people that were trying to undermine this amazing freedom uh, that, that he had preached in the churches in Galatia. And Paul was ticked. Can I say that? He was upset. Okay, he was, he was frustrated. And, and so, for example, in chapter 6, verse 11, he says, look at what large letters I'm writing you with. Have you guys ever sent like a text or an email and you made it like bold print and enlarge the font because you're so mad, you know? Paul was the original angry emailer, okay, because he's writing with large letters. I would love to have seen the original manuscript of this book. Or chapter 1, 6, he says, I'm shocked how quickly you are turning. Chapter 3, 1, he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And that word bewitched, it means who has confused you? Who's gotten in the way of your freedom? And basically, Paul wasn't questioning whether or not these Christians were, had brains or not. He was just questioning whether or not they were using their brains, like he was just calling them out. And really, this is my first point here. If you're taking notes or like to take notes, uh, you'll notice the first thing that Paul tells us in verse 1, he says, it's for freedom Christ has set us free. 
Now, I want you to catch this. It's for freedom Christ has set us free. In other words, Jesus didn't set us free for control. He didn't set us free to subjugate us. He didn't set us free to be a dull, boring, dry existence where there's no fun in your life anymore at all. He set us free for freedom is what he says. Right? I don't know about you, but nothing gets me more frustrated than when people reduce Christianity down to a system of rules and do's and don'ts. I think that's kind of how our culture paints Christianity at times, right? It's just a system of rules. Well, you can't do that. You're a Christian. Or you have to do that because you're a Christian. Let's just reduce it down to a bunch of rules or regulations. I'll never forget this. Um, my first job in ministry uh, many years back was that of a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor at this uh, very, very traditional church on the south side of Chicago. Now, I mean like traditional as in it was like 100 years of tradition and we wore three-poo suits every Sunday. I mean, it was a very traditional church. Uh, and so when I came to the church, there were not very many youth there understandably so. And so I love the fact that they hired a youth pastor like me because I wanted to do something about that. So I did what any youth pastor would do. I went and started hanging out in parking lots at street corners, just trying to meet the youth of the city because, listen, if they're not coming to me, I'm going to have to go to them, right? And so I'm hanging out with them, and I got to meet all these kids, and inevitably, I would invite them to come to church. I met this one kid named Cody. Cody was a rough kid, never been to church entire, in his entire life, yet he lived within sight of the building that we were meeting in. Right? So that was so weird to me. And so I invited him to church. Anyway, what happened was he comes in Sunday morning. I couldn't get to him in time because I was on the other side of the auditorium. He walks in, and one of these very well-meaning but stern-looking church ladies made a beeline for him, walked up to him, and said, uh, and basically when he walked in, he was wearing these flip-flops and cut-off shorts and, and a wife beater tank top. Like, he, he looked rough, right? And she goes, you can't wear that in church. And I heard it because I was trying to make my way over there and my heart sank. I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? You just told him that? Like, I, I wanted to say to this lady, I didn't because I had tact, but I wanted to say, you know, Jesus wore a toga and sandals all of his life, right? Like, would Jesus be welcome in this church if he walked in here right now? Would that be okay with you? I wanted to say that. I didn't. But what she did in that moment, while she probably meant well, she reduced Christianity down to nothing but a set of do's and don'ts. And that was Cody's first experience walking into a church, and it broke my heart, right? And so she made it more about law than she made it about love. And again, if you're taking notes, our connection with God shouldn't be based on a religion of laws. It should be based on a relationship of love. That should be our connection with God, right? And so Paul, sa Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, he says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There's freedom, what if this location was the one place people could walk in and all of Lee Summit, all of Blue Springs, all of Independence, and find the most freedom here? Not the most law, but the most freedom. What if? What would that look like? And so let me ask this before I move on. Is, is, do you feel freedom in your faith today? Like, do you feel that freedom, or do you feel maybe dry, dull, boring, set of rules, it's kind of lifeless. Maybe you're restless in your faith today. Because if that's the case, maybe there's a chance you've allowed it to kind of become a religion of laws, not a relationship of love. Maybe we've allowed it to become that. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Moving on. Second thing Paul tells us, verse 1, he says that Christ has set us free. This is simple, profoundly deceitful if we're not going to catch this, okay? So this is profound. A few weeks back, I was driving through a drive through to grab something to eat. Uh, I won't say the name of the restaurant, but its initials are Taco Bell. Uh, and so anyway, I, I got up to the window. It's the new one right across the highway here. I got up to the window, and as I was, the guy was giving me my food, he, he noticed my tattoos. And so he said, oh man, I like those tattoos. Like, what are those? And, and so I'm like, so I, I, by the way, I love it when people ask me about them. That's part of the reason why I got them is because I get to talk about God when they ask me. So they're Hebrew, right? I was in Israel a couple years ago. I fell in love with Hebrew when I was in seminary and stuff too. So this one right here is Hesed or Hesed, and it means God's loving kindness, his tenderness, his mercy. This one is God's, it's Maotz, and it means strength or refuge. And so when I tell people, it's kind of like it bookends God's nature, his mercy and kindness and his strength and his refuge. And so I get to talk about God. And so I'm talking to him and he goes, oh man, he goes, are you a pastor? I'm like, I am. He says, oh man, I'm not good enough to go to church. When he said that, I'm like, oh, what do you mean you're not good enough to go to church? How, how many people have ever heard someone say that? 
Like they're just not good. Okay, a lot of you have. Here's the problem with that statement. It's 100% accurate. It's factual, right? None of us are good enough to be in the presence of God. Absolutely none of us are. Romans 3.23, Paul made it straight. He said that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God's up here, we're down here. There's nothing to bridge that unless we have Jesus. And so none of us are good enough to be in God's presence. And so I don't know about how highly you think of yourself today, but I'm just going to go ahead and put this out there. It doesn't matter if you were born in the church, on the altar itself, with the elders surrounding you singing Kumbaya, holding their King James Bible in the air while wearing their WWJD bracelets, you're still not good enough. That's the reality. Without Jesus, none of us are good enough, right? I've heard of people, so many people say that. And so knowing that the problem with not believing that we're good enough, here's what happens, is it leads us to believe that there's something we need to do to be good enough. Right? It leads us down this very dangerous road. Like somehow I have to improve myself. Somehow I have to better myself. Then I will be accepted. Then I will be worthy of God's love. It's a very dangerous road that that one statement can lead us down. In fact, we say things like this, like, well, God only helps those who help themselves. Well, that's not anywhere in the Bible. Or, or you know, pull yourself up from your own bootstraps and then God will notice you. And it's like, whoa. All right, so here's the problem with that mentality is that is not freedom. That's the opposite of freedom. That's the opposite of the gospel. What it's called is it's a works-based gospel, and it depends on how hard we work in order for us to be accepted. Paul tells us in Colossians 1.3, he says that, it, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And then he tells us again earlier in Galatians 1.4, he says he, that Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present age. That word rescue always jumps out at me. Because here's the thing, rescue in the Greek, it means just that. It means to be saved, to be set free, to be rescued. That's exactly what it means. And every single time the word rescue is used in the context of Scripture, it's always meant to be used in the way that the one being rescued is at the mercy of the one doing the rescuing. You guys follow? And so, for instance, like, it it makes sense, right? Like, if if you're drowning, there's no lifeguard that walks over and says, hey, um, can you swim over here first and then I'll rescue you? Right? That doesn't happen, right? If you're in a burning building, no fire department shows up with a bullhorn and says, listen, if you could just come to the doorway, then I'll rescue you, right? That's not what a rescue is, right? If you're stuck on top of a mountain, I don't even know who rescues you, the army, right? They don't say climb down and then we'll rescue you. Whatever the case is, it's not a rescue if you can save yourself. And so the one being rescued is at the mercy of the one doing the rescuing. And so the only way we can find gospel freedom, listen to me, is not through the work that we do for Jesus. It's through the work that Jesus has done for us on the cross. That is the only way for us to find gospel freedom. It's not by the work that we do. But once we're set free, we are set free to do good works. Amen? But with this only way, listen, it is so easy for us to fall into this mentality that I have to try harder, be better for me to be accepted for God's love, right? In fact, just think about it this way. If anyone were to ask you today, how do you know you're a Christian? If your response starts with I or when I, or if it's anything to do with you, you're missing it. It's because he shed his blood for my sins, and that's how I know I'm redeemed. That's how I know I'm saved. I'll be honest, this type of gospel freedom is so contrary to the world and the world's economy. Do you ever realize how exhausting the world is that we live in? I mean, everything is performance-based. You go to work, it's all about your performance, right? If you don't do a good job, you don't have a job, right? Sports, I'm telling you right now, Mahomes did not get a $500 mil- or $500 million contract because he can't throw the football, Right? It's because he performs, right? Even, even um, our relationships at times are about performance. School is about performance. If you don't make the grade, you don't move on to the next grade. Everything is performance, performance. Jesus is the only relationship that we have where it's not about our performance, it's about his and how he has set us free and redeemed us. That is freedom. That is the freedom so many people are looking for. Jesus doesn't love, if you hear anything else I say today, hear this. Jesus doesn't love some future version of you, some better and improved version of you. He loves you now more than he ever will. Flaws and all, that's freedom. 
So moving on, the third thing that Paul tells us here in verse 1, he says to stand firm. Everyone say firm. Firm. Do not go back to slavery. Uh, how many of you have ever driven a car with a bad alignment? Anybody? Okay, I had this one car one time. It got hit by a drunk driver in the middle of the night. We weren't in it, thankfully, but it just messed up the car. And so we took it, got it fixed, but it was never the same again. So this car, every time we'd be driving it, if I took the hands off the steering wheel just for a minute, it would like veer into oncoming traffic. It was constantly trying to kill me, this car. And the funny thing is this car's name was a Dodge Avenger. That's what it was called. So it was trying to avenge something, I think, with my life, right? So anyway, we eventually sold it. This is what Paul is talking about here when he says, stand firm. Why? Because our sinful nature is constantly trying to veer into oncoming traffic. It's trying to veer us off course all the time. He's saying, stand firm. We need to stand firm because, and incidentally, this is what he was talking about to the Galatian churches too, because he wanted them to stand firm. And so check this out. For those of you that are Bible geeks, I'll, I'll go through this real quick and then we'll land this, but... You might recall that the churches Paul was writing to were in the region of Galatia. That's modern-day Turkey. So modern-day Turkey, of course, is north of Israel. All right, so what happened is, is that Paul had planted these churches in this region of Galatia and moved on. Paul was like the Oprah of church planners. You know, he's like, you get a church, and you get a church. And so he just planted churches everywhere. So he planted churches, he moved on. And then what happened is, in the meantime, these guys from the, the home church, the flagship church down in Jerusalem, decided to visit up to, Jerusalem, or up to the churches in Galatia that kind of check out Paul's new churches. That sounds great, right? And so as they're up there, here's the thing. These Jewish Christians probably stuck out like sore thumbs because they were in a Gentile region, a non-Jewish region, right? And then word probably got out really fast that, hey, there are some people from the home church in Jerusalem here, right? So word probably spread. Apparently, at some point, these Jewish Christians decided that they wanted to kind of capitalize on their rock star status. And so they started telling these Galatian Christians, these non-Jewish Christians, hey, if you want to be a really good Christian like we are, you got to follow some of the Old Testament laws. And of course, the problem with that is that the Gentile Christians are like, what's the Old Testament law? <laughs> I don't even know what that is, right? And so they're listening to this and they're like, oh, we got to do that. We got to do that too. And we got to be a better Christian and all this sort of things too. And so incidentally, this is why Paul calls these guys Judaizers. Judaizers, they're trying to make the Christian faith more Jewish. I love the word Judaizer. I think it's the perfect Christian cuss word. It's like someone cuts you off in traffic, you Judaizer! Just yell that out and see what they say, all right? But anyway, so these were the Judaizers, right? And so without a doubt, it makes sense now why Paul was so angry, so frustrated that they were cutting into their freedom. And so here's the problem, though. Whether, they, whether we realize it or not, we still do the same thing the Judaizers were doing 2,000 years ago. We just do it in more subtle ways. So here's two ways I believe that we actually pervert, we ruin our gospel freedom. All right, and if you're taking notes, you might want to write these down. I think that there's entire churches and denominations that prefer gospel freedom. All right, so check this out. The first way we ruin our gospel freedom is that we simply add to it. We add things to our freedom. And honestly, I don't think that we do this intentionally. Raise your hand if you wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to ruin my freedom today. Okay, we don't do that. That's not what we do. I think that we have best intentions, right? But deep down, I think that we really believe the gospel is a little bit too good to be true. I mean, let's be honest. How can a guy named Jesus 2,000 years ago come along and say I'm forgiven and wipe out my past, my sins, my mistakes, my lies, my anger, everything I've ever done wrong, how can he just come along and say that's, that's forgiven? It just sounds a little bit too good to be true. I mean, you know, John, says, John says in 836 that the sun sets you free. You are free indeed, but it's too easy, right? And so what do we do? Our nature, our natural response is to add things to our, our freedom to kind of act like we've earned it a little bit. In fact, let me ask this. How many of you have a hard time accepting big gifts? Okay, that's why, right? We have a hard time. We had somebody when I was a youth pastor, I shared this uh, a couple years ago, but we had, somebody gave us a Jeep Grand Cherokee. They wanted to give us a vehicle. Right? My wife and I are like, whoa, you know, because our car had just gotten hit by that drunk driver. Like, that's, that's very nice, and it's very kind, but no, we can't take it. The person insisted. And I'm like, listen, you can't give us a vehicle. That's like a lot of money. And, and so he insisted again, and I'm like, okay, fine, 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 fine. I'll take the vehicle, but here's what's going to happen. I'm going to come over to your house and cut your lawn every week. I'm going to paint your, I'm going to rub your feet every night for five years. Like, I'm just throwing all these things out there. Why? Because I was trying to earn the gift that he was freely giving me. It made me feel better about it. 
You catch that? I do, we do the same thing with the gospel. And so, like, for instance, denominations. I love denominations. They're good for doctrine and theology. But here's the thing. Some denominations can require, for instance, everyone to go through a confirmation class. Because everyone knows that you can't be a Christian if you don't go through a 13-week class. Sarcasm is my fluent language. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so that's obviously not true. Or, or maybe a church might require you to boycott a business because they don't have the same beliefs as the church does because everybody knows Jesus would never go where there are sinners. More sarcasm, sorry. <laughs> or, or maybe it's, 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 we, we require everyone to read the same, same Bible translation as us because everybody knows Jesus only hears in Old English. And so if you don't say thee and thou, he ain't even listening to you today, right? But we see, we put these little things in there, and before we know it, we're requiring these things. Like, if that person didn't do that, we're better than them. In fact, it kind of makes us feel like we're better Christians than maybe that church down the street who doesn't do that. And what we're doing is we're adding to our freedom. Again, this kind of freedom is exhausting because it's not freedom at all. And eventually, people walk away from their faith. Write this down, the gospel will never work if it's about our works. It will never work if it's about our work. And so if you add stuff to your freedom, it's not freedom. It's kind of like being in prison and having your jail sentence pardoned. They come over and open up the jail cell, and they say, you're free, and you grab a spork, right, a plastic spoon, and you start tunneling your way out of the prison for the rest of your life. It's like, wait, 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 you've been set free. Why are you working for your freedom? It's the same thing we do. Right? Second way we pervert our gospel freedom is that we just go to the other extreme, is that we then just continue living however we want. And, we, and, and if God's grace is so amazing, then clearly I can just live however I want because, well, His grace is amazing, right? And, and honestly, I think this is probably the most perverted form of freedom that we have, gospel in our church in America today. Right? In fact, I have a term for this. You guys might like this. I call this Christian atheism. Those are two words that shouldn't go together, right? But honestly, Christian atheists, in my opinion, are people that know Jesus, but they don't live like they know Jesus. So they have the same entertainment values as people in the world do. They spend their money the same way, and they talk the same, and they live the same, all these sort of things. So they know some things about Jesus, but they don't really know Jesus. And so these Christian atheists, they just, they kind of try to take advantage of Jesus' grace. Paul addresses this later in Galatians 5. He says, for we were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom to continue uh, or as an opportunity for the flesh. So in other words, if we are recipients of God's grace, there should be something tangibly different about us. We live differently. That doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. But it does mean that we're forgiven and there's something different about us. And so bottom line, this is why Paul is telling us, stand firm. Do not go back to bondage. Don't add stuff to your freedom. Or better yet, don't even go the other direction and just live in sin like you always did. Amen. That's not freedom either. Let me close with this thought. I started out today asking this question, what if? Like this is our series, what if? What if we truly lived gospel freedom? What if we truly lived it? Because let's be honest, we look around the world today it seems like everything is just crazy, right? It's, it's difficult. It, it, it's, there's so much bondage happening. People are always hateful or they're being angry or they're offended at everything these days. Can, can you be free when you're constantly offended? No. And this is the world we live in today. And so I think people are looking for freedom, but the problem is they're looking for it in the wrong places. They're looking towards the government. They're looking for the, you know, a better economy or a better job, or they're looking for handouts, or they're looking for um, politicians to solve this. And the thing is, all of that will never be solved with them. It only comes from living the freedom of Jesus Christ. I like how one pastor put it, and I'll close with this quote. His name is Dale Partridge. He said this, God's mission isn't to change politics, it's to change hearts. It's to not make people woke, it's to make them born again. It's to not make people better, it's to make them new. That's what the gospel does. Jesus sets us free and we are new creations. And it's for freedom that Christ has sent us free. So as we leave here, two questions. One, are you living gospel freedom? Have you accepted Christ and found that freedom? Maybe it's religion you've been living and you've never found the freedom of a relationship. And then secondly, are you willing to be agents of gospel freedom in the world around us? Because people are looking for freedom, and if we have it, they're going to want it. Are we living it? 
Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, you're such an amazing God that you would set us free for freedom. And then you even warn us, stand firm. Don't go back to slavery. Lord, I pray if there's anybody in here today that's been living in slavery and bondage, Lord, that they would be set free. They would accept you as their personal savior and find the freedom that they're desperately seeking. Lord, I also pray for anybody we come in contact with in the next couple days, weeks, months, that we'd be agents of this freedom, that we'd allow others to see what amazing gospel freedom looks like and that they would also want that freedom. Lord, we ask this in your name.